Welcome to lecture five. So we're now going to switch to a new IRC server, and I'm going to give you lots of different ways you can connect up to it. If you want, just stick with the Chatzilla from before, and I'm going to go see if I can connect up to it here. Today should be the last time that we switch servers for IRC, and you won't have more problems, I hope. I'll go ahead and walk through starting up Chatzilla. So here I started Chatzilla. I'm going to do my stuff from the Mac here because we're, we're running low on computers and I might even bring in some more computers in case we have other people sitting in throughout the semester. But inside of Chatzilla, last time we did attach and we did a free node address. So now we're going to use this address up here. And so you do attach, research, tools, ccom, nh. Now you can still use the free node service if you want, that, that channel. If there's nobody on there, you'll be creating it as the first user. If a bunch of you want to use that outside, if you're not at CCOM, then you can use free node. This one will only work if you're on a CCOM workstation or in the classroom or a CCOM specific laptop. Anything else is gonna be on a different network and we will not be able to see this. So when we work on this IRC server, that stuff stays within inside of CCOM. So there won't be random people from the outside world jumping in. So I'm attached to Research Tools, CCOM NH. So I'm now connected up. And I'm using a laptop that's actually a CCOM laptop here. So I'll do join and pound UNH Research Tools without any spaces. And I see a few of you in there. Great. I see a few more jumping in. And I'm going to skip showing you other ways to set up, but in the notes, there's a tool called Pigeon, which is an instant messenger client that works on Windows, Linux, and Mac. It supports IRC, AOL Instant Messenger, Google Chat, and lots of other stuff. As noted by some people in the past, I don't always notice the IRC during class if I'm working on class stuff. If you really want a response from me as opposed to just someone else in the class, when you post in the IRC channel, you got to let me know to go look at the screen because I'm looking at multiple different places at the same time. So for today, I've got notes online. If you go and look at the research tools webpage that I've set up, the Blackboard page has a link to it. And on Blackboard, I'll post links, but all the material will be on this webpage so that you know, if for some reason Blackboard and, and your password aren't playing nicely, or if you want to share this with someone else, you can just give them this link and it's public. Today's lecture notes, as with all of our lecture notes so far, are still in draft form. But lectures one through four have audio files available. So I've been trying to keep up with those. And lecture five has got notes in HTML form. So if you click on that, you can follow along. And if you're having trouble copying and typing in what we do today, you can do a copy paste instead of just typing. Like we had the trouble last time with data logger one being trouble and that that one looked like much like an L at the end. For People who haven't been here before, on that same web page, there is a link to VMware Ubuntu Virtual Machines. If you click on that, this is where all the virtual machines that we'll have done will live. And you need to download both the VMDK and VMX. So jumping into the lecture notes. Now I've been showing you guys a lot in the weeds. So I've been doing like IRC and CD and move and make directories. I wanted to show you guys some tools that you can use right away. I'm going to try and do a little bit of this each class if I can remember to do that so that you can have something that you can use immediately. This is one that uh, the person who's responsible for me doing this is sitting in the corner, it's Ben, talked me into using a bookmarking service called Delicious. And the idea of, of a bookmarking service is that you may be using multiple computers. All of you are in this room. You don't have the same account. You have the same login and password, but all of your files on these machines are not the same files as your laptop, your home machines. And if you go out elsewhere and use a different computer, your bookmarks and things like that don't follow you. But if you use one of these services, you can have things like your bookmarks, such that you log in from each computer and you have access to your same bookmarks. With Delicious, you can make them public or keep them private. So this way, if you want to, you can actually create bookmarks that other people can see. So as you do your research, people can follow along what you're doing. That's great, but I want to throw in a warning before we go into this. Uh, there's a couple different warnings. One is don't use the same password as you use on your other accounts. Uh, I'm going to show you probably next time how to use a program called KeePassX 
to keep all of your passwords encrypted and it will help you generate crazy looking passwords that are super secure. So for now, you've got to create a new password and we don't yet have a mechanism to remember all these passwords, but please do not use your CCOM password on this service. I can't stress that enough, use a different password. And let me give you a quick, quick jump and show you Delicious. There's lots and lots of users. Up on the front page will be sort of a top hits of people's bookmarks. So if you want to see what people are bookmarking a lot of, you can see that going on. For each user has a page for their bookmarks. So if you want to take a look at mine, my username is goat bar, as in where goats go to drink up in the mountains. And you can see in here that you'll see some of the, the bookmarks that I've been making as I work on things like this class. You'll see like here I was, I've been using Audacity to record the classes and to edit the, the audio. 1,600 people have bookmarked that, so it's pretty popular. Here's notes on uh, a SciPy course. We're going to see SciPy as a Python library for science, mapping stuff, et cetera, et cetera. This surface has something called tags. So for every bookmark, you can add tags to a particular entry and create order out of this chaos. So if you just had a pile of bookmarks, you could try to come up with folders, and that's the typical strategy that people use when they do bookmarking in a browser. But here you can just add whatever tags you want to it. So for Audacity, I've added Audacity because uh, there's lots of links for that. Podcasting, podcast, tutorials, and research tools. Research tools is something that I'm using for links related to this course. And you can then go and click on research tools, and you see all the tags, all the items that I've tagged for research tools. Some of them may not seem like they're very important yet to you because I've got things that are going on in my head that I'll eventually bring into the course. But some of them might be interesting as you go along. So there's lots of interesting stuff in there. And this is basically a service where you can then hook into this from each of your computers and you can add it, a plugin to Firefox, Chrome, and IE. There's probably other browsers too where you actually add buttons that go right into Delicious. So I've got these three buttons up here. This is Firefox. If I hit this button, you get a dialog box, something like this, where I can bookmark something. I can add tags in. Let's pick something more interesting to slash.org. Or if you haven't seen slash dot, it's news for nerds. We'll hit tag. And hopefully in a few seconds, you'll see some recommendations pop up as it's working. So now it's gone off, found some recommended tags. It's looked at my tags and said, these are the ones that fit well. It's looked at tags from other people and said, these ones work well. So it gives you some hints as to how you might want to organize your material. Now, you can also add some comments. There's a really interesting feature that I first thought was. So here, I've linked in my delicious tag cloud. It's one of those things that I first saw. It sort of seemed pointless. You know, here's all the tags, and the font is changing size based on how many tags I've done, how frequently, and how recent. The cool thing about this is it actually goes through my tags as I generate them, and it tries to give you a sense of what's important to me. If you have a user on here and you go look at their tag cloud, you can see, so last year, the biggest one on here is Deepwater Horizon. So that was a big thing for my world recently. You can see Python. You can see research tools here is starting to grow a little bit bigger. And it gives you a sense of the things that I'm tagging about AIS. This is ship tracking, one of the things I do for my research. And you can start to see what's important to a person at a quick glance. If you create your own delicious thing, you can then share this tag cloud with people and they can get a sense of your research and, and ideas as you go without necessarily getting all the details of what you're actually doing. Delicious is free. There are also lots of other bookmarking services out there. You can also use the FireSync inside of Firefox, or Chrome has one built in. I believe IE probably does too. I don't use IE, so I don't really know. And I put in some links in the course notes for a list of social bookmarking websites and a comparison of browser synchronizers. This way, as you move through the world, as long as you have connection to the internet, you can get access to that data that you're working with. Super important, back it up. Don't use a service that won't let you back up your data. Delicious has an export link. Use it. Save that file somewhere else because if Delicious as a company disappears or whoever owns them decides to kill the service, your data may just disappear. The trouble with the cloud service, for example, Yahoo, we all thought that Yahoo was going to be around for a long time. Yahoo put itself up for sale last week. They were this huge internet company. They were the number one search engine for a long time. And now they're saying, hey, wait, 
let's sell off a lot of our stuff. Maybe we'll shut down some services and all of you who counted on it are kind of out of luck. So be careful with cloud services and make sure to back up. That's our fun do something right away example for the day. Now let's jump into actually using our virtual machine and starting to explore some data. Put together a sample data set and use that data set today to have you guys walk through some examples and start to see how to look at data and figure out what is it and what can I do with it. So let's go ahead. We're going to grab this data set, but don't use this link right here. We're going to do it from the terminal. I'm going to try and push you guys into using more command line stuff than you're probably used to. So normally you would just right click this and do a save. That'll put that into your Windows environment, not your virtual machine. We're going to go into the virtual machine and we're going to run this command right here. And I've created a, a tiny URL that points to this really long URL to go grab the examples off of the class website. And I'm going to bring up the virtual machine. I'm going to hit play. If it doesn't think the VMware tools are running, that's okay. They will run in a moment. And if you don't know the username and password off the top of your head, you haven't memorized it yet, that's okay. The username is research tools. The password is an exclamation point. The lowercase letter R as in rover, T as in tank. The number is 2011, so our year. And then the lowercase letters V as in Victor and M as in Mary. Why did I choose a 32-bit operating system? Because I was trying to download it yesterday, and there's so many options. That was a tough one. It would be really great to use a 64-bit operating system for some of the things that we're going to do with large files. But for the class, I wanted to start off with something where I knew everything would work for sure. If we try to, to work with files greater than 3 or 4 gigabytes, we'll hit errors with things, and occasionally with 2 gigabytes. But for this course, we're not going to work with files that big. If we were building a VM to go and take out for production use, I would try to make it 64-bit. We'll probably put one together in the, after the course is done to do the same exact stuff and then work through all the bugs of 64-bit stuff. Not everything builds for it correctly right now. We're still working through some of the issues of getting all the software available. The first thing to do is we're going to want to give ourselves a nice little link. I don't have any items in here. There's no terminal for easy use. You can go into Applications, Accessories, and get yourself a terminal. But what we want to do is add that up here so it's just one click. So I'm going to right click on this top panel bar, add to panel, and there's these two sort of springs with a board on top or something. The second one is application launcher. This is going to take items from that application launcher and put them up here so that we can get to them quickly. These are basically just aliases, so I'm going to click forward. And what we want is under accessories, and I'm going to have you add two. One of them is for later in the class if we get to it. And that will be GNU Emacs. Click Add at the bottom. And you'll see a little E with a little something through it on a purple circle appear up there. And if you scroll down, you'll see the terminal. Click Add on the terminal. If you go back, so if those of you who missed this part, if you go up to the top, there's this little triangle on the left that sort of uh, expand this region to expand that and then scroll down to terminal and add terminal. And so then you'll have this little mini terminal icon and then this weird E. So see this little arrow here on the left? See this little tiny arrow? Click on that and then add the GNU Emacs and then there will also be a terminal down below. So then scroll down. So now you have the E right there. Now scroll down and there will be a terminal. So once you're done with that, you can click close to the add panels. And we'll go ahead and start a, start a terminal. I'm going to go back and grab that link. We're going to grab this wget. So we're going to grab this. I'm going to copy that. We would probably you can do a control C in Windows. I'm going to do a copy back here, and I'm going to do an edit paste. You'll do a wget of this tiny URL examples file, and when you're ready, hit enter. It's going to run off to the server and grab this. We're going to do it all at the same time, so we're going to clobber our network a little bit here. So go back to your web browser, do a copy. Now go back there, then go edit paste. It's not letting you do it at all. Yeah. Get rid of the drop down menu and kill your terminal. Just hit the X. Start a new terminal. Edit. Copy. I think you're going to have to type it in. There's something up with copy paste on your machine. 
that I don't know about. We haven't hit that before. So you're going to have to do a little extra typing compared to other people. <laughs> it's Control Shift V. So in this terminal, it's not just Control V. You have to actually do Control Shift V as in Victor and then hit Enter. Control C has a lot of uses in the terminal. So they tried to get, put an extra shift on there. And don't forget to say hi in the chat room. I'll read that later. So let's go ahead and take a look at this file that we just downloaded. If we do ls-l, it's kind of annoying to have things wrap, so I tend to make my terminal wider. So I have this file here on this line, examples 2011, 09, 13. I name things usually with four digits year, two digits month, two digits day. So you're going to see that a lot with me. It's always good to have lots of windows open so that you can always be turned around. It's a little confusing here because we have a file that we want to download that actually has a different name. And wget just looked at the URL and grabbed the name that it thought should be there. And so we want to rename this. And so we can do a MV examples. Now I hit tab there. So I just typed uh, EX, hit tab, and that completes as best it can what's going on. And you see how it got stuck? There's two example thingies in this directory. There's an examples dash and our year. This is the one we have. And then there's this examples.desktop. So it can't figure out which one of those we want. If you hit tab a couple more times, it'll show you what it thinks it could be. And it needs you to type one more character to get past this. So if we type a dash, it now will know that it wants the one that's dash and then the year. So if we hit tab again, it'll complete all the way out. And then do that again. So examples dash the year. And we're going to add on our extension, keep things a little bit clearer. Now extensions are hints. They don't change what's in the file, but they're hints to programs to what's in that file. So we're going to add a dot tar dot bz number two. So go ahead and do that. Now if we do an ls dash l, you'll notice the color changed. So now it's red. It's still right there. It's still the same number of bytes. And what this is, is it's a tape archive. It's a kind of like a zip file, if you've seen those for Windows. It's a file that contains lots of other files and directories. So you can basically scoop up a part of a computer, put it into one file, and pass that file around between people or computers a lot easier than you can, say, several hundred little files and directories. Why we renamed it? We've renamed it to hint to ourselves that it's a tar and bz. A lot of tools will sort of count on that extension to help you out. If we do completions, it wants to see a dot tar to know that if you're using a tar, it will then. I can't uh, the file without the you, you totally could. It's just we're trying to be clean. You can name your files anything. You can name every single file with random characters. After about a day of doing that, you're going to go crazy. It's a great question, and we're going to do it not because it changes the contents, but because it's a hint to us. We can take a look at that with the command called tar, T-A-R. We can ask for help, if you remember, with dash dash help. And it's going to give you all sorts of annoying stuff, and you can read it later. Or you can type man tar, and you'll get the man page for tar. So all the commands you see today, you can always try to run the man command to get more info on it. There's not always a man page for everything. And remember, the Q key gets you out of a man page. If you get desperate, you can always close the terminal. So we're going to now take a look at that tar file. It's got some funny options. It's got lots and lots of options. T says we're going to view. So I'm not sure what T stands for, but basically it's the list what's in there. F says we're going to give it a file. There's lots of other fancy things you can do with tar. It doesn't have to do with actual files. Every V that you add gives you more details about what's going in there. So V stands for verbose. So we're going to run this TFVV. And you're going to hit Enter. It may be a little slow, so you can always hit Control-C partway through if you feel like you don't want to see the rest of it and wait for it to go through that tar and find everything in there. But it's going to show us that we have a pretty nice tar. By pretty nice means to me that if you have a tar, it opens up and expands just into one folder. It's pretty mean to people to have a tar file that just has, drops files wherever. If it does that, I've had times where you don't think about what you're doing. You untar something in a file with all of your files, and now you have a mixture of somebody else's stuff and your stuff, and you're trying to figure out which one belongs to you 
and which one came from this tar. It's really annoying. Excellent question. This part says it's tape archive. This second part, the BZ2, which we're going to talk more about and we're going to use all the time, says this is compressed with a command called bzip2. There's lots of compression programs, but bzip and gzip are the two main ones that you're going to see in here. You'll also see zip, which is a combination of compression and sticking files together. Zip sort of comes from the Windows world of things. It's OK. It's a lot easier from the Unix world to use tar. And we typically use tar more often than zip. Does so we like have corrupt your files or something if you do it differently. Like I don't know, or maybe that's something corrupting the files. Yes. Well, what? Why would it? How does it change it differently by compressing it differently? Zip and tar know different things about file permissions and dates and times and how things are organized. Also, when you work with zips on the Windows side, you often produce zips that are proprietary. WinZip will do com encryption and use formats that are not publicly available, and you can produce a zip that you only can use from WinZip. So you're forcing everybody to go out and buy a copy of WinZip. It's nice to have that compression there, but we have ways on Unix to do compression and encryption and all that stuff that you'd like to do in steps, as opposed to just in one giant blob. So now we have a look in there, and it looks OK. Let's unpack all these files. Yep. Yeah, sorry, of course. To, uh, change the, uh, file name on my so you did MV. Oh, right up on the board here. So when you start off with that MV command, it's going to be MV, your source file name. So you need to have the examples dash without the dot tar dot bz2, which you don't have. And then you have the destination. It's often written DST. This will be that long file name with the tar.bz2 on the end. This is the file that you do have, and this is the file that you want to have. Did it work? Yes. The next command, we're going to go ahead and extract that. X is the character for extract, so it's tar, xf, and then the file name. Tar actually knows about bzip and gzip compression. Bzip2 and gzip. You don't have to tell anything special to uncompress that file on the fly. It'll just do it. Hit Enter. Now, I haven't put any Vs on there for verbose, so it's going to be quiet and just work on it. That can be a little frustrating if you download a multiple gigabyte file and you start untarring it. And you have no idea how far through the file you are. It can get a little annoying as you sit there and wait and hope. So here, finish for me. No such file or directory. Do an ls-l. Do a listing, ls-l, of your directory. You missed the rename step, so you need to do an MV of examples, ex tab, now a dash, hit tab, and then the new name, so ex tab, dash, hit tab. Now back up one character with the backspace key and type dot tar dot bz2. Hit enter, and now do another listing, so ls-l again except there's a space between the ls and the dash. So see now you have it renamed so that it's the correct. Mm -hmm. So hit the up arrow until you go back to your command that wasn't working. One more. OK, there's your command to extract it. Give that a try. So hit Enter, and it's now working. What was the tfvv command? I missed that one. Sure. All the stuff's in the notes, too, this time. I actually was able to write that up before class. T, so if you do tar, tfvv, T is the, op the operation that you're doing. F says it's on a file. So this is list a file and how verbose. So if you add more Vs, it gets more verbose. And then your file name. I don't know how many Vs you can add until it stops adding more information. But depending on the tool, sometimes you can do a lot. So the next command that we can do is to start taking a look at what's in there. So we can do ls-l. And you're going to see this is the tar file that we started out with. And this is the directory of unpacked stuff that got created. There's a really nifty command called tree that you can run on a directory tree. And it will print out sort of a visualization of what's in there. It's all text-based. And it doesn't copy and paste into many programs well because it's using some funny characters. But if we say tree, examples, and then our timestamp, and hit Enter, you're going to get this little graphical representation of what's in there. And it's going to be colored just like ls, where directories are blue. Files that are compressed are red. Things that are just files it doesn't know about are white. 
things that are marked as executable are green. When we hit programs, the programs are this greeny yellow color. It's not really a green, it's not really yellow, somewhere in between. And there's a few other ones where it's got this sort of aqua y color for some of the audio files it recognized. We have a directory, it's the name, because in the file there is this directory, or because the way we extract. Why do we have the directory tree created from our tar? So in the tar, it actually encodes that directory tree. It isn't just a container that you throw things into, it actually keeps the structure that you create. So if you have a directory tree with you know, like examples, you know, and you have another folder called one and a folder called two, you know, your Word doc here and your data over here, so some like Excel spreadsheet, it's gonna keep those folders and the whole structure that you captured. Yes, so we extract it in the current directory and it just will create this tree underneath where we are. People often use the tar command for backups. So you can back up huge portions of your computer and just say tar this whole area, give me one big file that represents all the data in this portion of my tree, like my home directory. If I want to extract in a particular directory? These ways just CD and change directory into that directory and untar there. Because you can specify with the tar command with that file, you can say tar xf and you can point to any path. It could be, you could go into my directory if, you, if I had an account on that machine and say schwer examples dot tar. It could be anywhere. So as long as you, you know where that tar is and can point to it, then you extract in the current directory. You can get very fancy with this stuff, but I don't want you guys to worry anything more about tar other than we're going to make some tars later on and right now you're unpacking it to get some examples. So let's go ahead and, and CD into that folder. CD examples. And one fancy thing is some of these commands, when you try to expand them, there's multiple examples, files, and directories. There's that examples desktop. It knew that since I did a CD that I was looking for only directories. So it's not going to complete with anything other than folders and directories. If I'm in the CD command, I hit tab, it's going to ignore all the other noise that's out there in that directory. But we just want to go into examples, and we'll do an ls-l, and you'll see there's a lot of files in here. I tried to create a little example working area that's got all sorts of data. Some of it's real, some of it's just quick made up stuff that's just meant to be simple. And what we want to do is start looking at this stuff and see how it's put together. But before I do that, I kind of want to have a sense of the size of things. The last command I ran was ls-l for a long listing, and it's giving us this column of numbers right in the middle here that's our file size. If we add a dash h to that, I've showed that to you before, it's going to show you in bytes if it's small, in k, which is kilobytes if it's a little bit bigger, m for megabytes, g for gigabytes, and I haven't worked with too many terabyte files, so I presume that will be a t, but... So here's a 15 megabyte file, here's a 407k file. So you can see how big things are. And there's actually a way on the system to open up files in the default application. You can ask Linux and say, please open up this file. Pick an application for me that you think is the best or my preferred one. On the Mac, that command is called open. On Linux, they've hit it away a little bit and I have to keep looking it up because I always forget. It's a little bit funny, and you'll have to either make an alias later on or just remember this. It's xdpg-open. One of the files in here is called field procedure manual may 2011.pdf. So this is a PDF document that I grabbed from the NOAA website. Some of you might be familiar with it. And you can do this xdg-open. And it should pop up xdg-open field procedures manual. This is the nice thing about the command line tools in especially Ubuntu is that they often recommend, I think you really meant to run this other command. They know a little bit about that. So if we type that, up comes a document browser with a PDF in it. You're gonna be starting to learn to write scripts and at the end of your script you've produced like a PDF document and you wanna then bring it up in a browser. Your programs that you write can call this command and say, hey, open this final document that I've created and present it to me. 
which is really nice if you're doing long running scripts. We sometimes around here write stuff that takes it, you know, even a day or two to run. And if you sit there and watch a computer for a day or two for your program to finish, you're going to go crazy. But if at the end it pops up the end result, or if it's opening partial results as you go, that can be really nice. And I picked this document in particular because we're going to see this throughout the year. And if you're taking the CAT A certification class, you'll definitely want to pay attention to this. This is the NOAA manual for how to go out and do hydrographic surveys. So if you want to see what, what NOAA thinks it takes to go out and survey the ocean, this is a key document to have in hand. Even if you're not doing hydrographic surveys yourself, if you're doing other kinds of ocean surveys, there's lots of techniques in this document. This is how a big government organization has worked really hard to come up with uh, best practices for them. And so if you, you can use this as either a starting template or a way to just get background on material or as a place to start from and adopt a new procedure based on something they've created. When we get into more detailed depths of this data, we're going to go in there and actually look at some of the entries. So you can do Control A. We'll go back to the beginning of the line. And you can use the arrow keys to edit. So you haven't run packed this examples. So do a tar, T-A-R, space XF, space EX, and then press tab. Hit enter. Then CD into it when it's done. Working, working, working. CD, space examples, EX tab. Hit enter. Go up to that. X, hit the up arrow to see this open command again. One more. Keep going up. We're right there. Now I press return or enter. And there you have a field procedures manual. Please do, if you get stuck, shout out and ask for help. It takes some uh, getting used to how to do all this stuff. And if you're waiting for us, feel free to read about that document. It's, it's got some neat stuff in there. So you're getting lots of error messages about timestamps. That's OK. One of the problems with virtual machines is when we shut them down, they sometimes lose their sense of time. If you look at the clock, it may be off. Do an ls-l. So yours says it's September 8th, even though it's September 13th today. Don't worry about that. If you get errors about time, it's not a big deal. You can just leave the time. We can do that another time, and I'll put notes in the lecture about how to change time. OK, if you go in here and do an ls-l, so you see you have this examples directory. You need to cd into there. So cd space examples, hit tab. Now press Enter. And now if you do an ls-l, you'll see all the documents. xdg-open. And you can type xdg-open a capital F and probably hit tab. So xdg-open and capital F and press tab and it will complete the rest of it for you. And I wanted to make sure that you all saw this field procedure manual now at this point in your career <laughs> at UNH rather than somewhere in the middle of the summer hydro course when you're trying to figure out something and someone says, why didn't you read the field procedure manual for at least hint as to what you're doing? This document, it isn't always the way it's going to be done here. Some of the professors here have their own take on how to look at data and do procedures, but it's really nice to have that up your sleeve to be able to go read when you want a second opinion on how to do something or just another approach on the same topic. So when you need to go to sleep late at night, I recommend opening up this document and uh, starting to read. And we'll talk about why bags are uh, executable in a little bit, possibly the next lecture. It's not a good thing that they're executable. It's a mistake. Next topic is going to be using a, a command it gets a little confusing in this section because we're going to be using a command called file. And so we're talking about running the command file on files. File is this clever thing where they build up a database of information about file types. So it knows a little bit about how does a PDF start. It doesn't care about the name of a file. It cares about the contents of a file. So it's going to look in there and look at the bytes in that file and say, I think it's a what. So in the case of a PDF, the first couple characters in a PDF file actually have PDF written out. So we're going to run file. So you're actually going to use the name file. And then on what? 
And if you remember last time, we talked about matching patterns. So we can say file star for everything. So let's go ahead and do that, and it's going to be a lot of junk. But it learns when you tell it. So with the file command, I've actually gone in. It's not yet in this version of Ubuntu, but I think the next version of Ubuntu will actually know about some multi-beam formats. Because I sat there and tried to figure out how to identify that particular format and then add it to this database that it has. So if you have a new file format that you want to have added, we can sit down and see if it's possible to create a definition file that explains how that's put together. But for example, like a Kongsberg Simrad multi-beam file has about 70 or 80 different possible starting byte combinations. I kind of gave up after I realized that and said, well, you know what, I'm not that motivated to go create the definition for, for a Simrad file. And some of them were vague enough that they conflict with other definitions. So that one was pretty hard. But if you do file star, you're going to get a whole lot of junk. Don't expect much of that to make sense. And in fact, I'm going to go back and run this again. And I'm going to pipe it to head. So the vertical bar passes data from one command to the next command. And the head command takes the first 10 lines, unless you tell it otherwise. But it's just going to grab only the first 10 lines. And then it's going to stop receiving data from file and ignore it. I'm going to do a bunch of blank lines so we can actually see this. And I'll rerun the file with head. So I'm going to walk up here and walk you through just a few of them so you see them. So here is this file. It's 0479, a whole bunch of stuff, rvcs.all.bz2. So that was our compressed file. Wave your hand wildly if you need help getting the file command to work. OK, you've done file, space, star. So go ahead and just hit enter the first time and see what happens. So you got a whole bunch of junk. Hit the up arrow. Yep, so I'll bring back your last command. Now add that vertical bar, which is right underneath backspace there, yeah. And then head. Yep. It's always wise to put spaces in for the shell between different things. In this case, you could figure out that head and the vertical bar were separate entities. There's times when it can't figure that out, and you'll get some confusing errors. It doesn't work. This is when you guys are going to find all the edge cases on me and uh, file star pipe head. OK, yep. Hit enter just a couple times to get yourself some blank lines. Or type clear. Just type clear and hit enter. So that gives you a blank one. Now hit up arrow to get the file command. Pipe head. It's just you were seeing the same thing again and again so many times it's hard to tell that it's actually rerunning and working. So let's just take a quick peek at some of the stuff that we have here. When you see data, that means it saw some binary data and didn't know what it was. ASCII English text with control LF line terminators. Uh, that means that's sort of a DOSI formatted file with something in it that it didn't recognize. JPEG image data, that's a picture. Here we have a folder where I made a directory. This is bags.sqlite. This is an SQLite 3 database. So it's a database that lives in a file. Here we have my delicious bookmarks that I saved a bunch of for you to play with. It didn't quite get that that was an HTML document. It thought it was an SGML document text. If you ever start working with SGML, I'll be very impressed. And I'll ask you how you did it. But we don't work with that stuff, really. In a format file that was DOS text, really simple. And it showed up very similar to the ASCII English text except for it couldn't figure out there were English words in there. Empty file actually just shows up as empty. So if you do touch in some file name, it'll show up empty. And then here, it didn't just tell us a PDF document. It also told us the version of the PDF standard that that document was written to. And you'll see we have two PDFs in here, and they each have different versions. Now, a lot of the stuff you're going to see won't make too much sense. So hopefully things like JPEG you've run into before and you're familiar with. But you're going to see them so many times that by the end of this course, you should be able to just spout out what they are without having to think about it. So it looked here at this top one, the RVCS data, and said, I see it's compressed. I'm not going to look in there. I don't really feel like wasting the energy to go uncompress this and, and tell you. If you really want to do this, you probably want to uncompress your data. If we do an ls-l star.gz and star.bz2, this should list for us all the files that are compressed with gz compression and bz2 compression if the naming convention is held in this directory. So we've got four files that are compressed. We've got three with bzip, bz2 extensions. 
And you can tell here that this one is a different color, this uh, SEGI, S-E-G-Y file. It's got the execute bit set, so it's listed as a program, even though if you ran it, who knows what would happen. It's just data that got flagged incorrectly. There's two different commands. So each of those compression formats has its own uncompressed command. For bzip2, if you just type b-u-n-z and hit tab, it'll say bunzip2, and then we can say star.bz2. And that will go through and uncompress all the bz2 files. You could just say star, and it's just look at each of the ones that isn't uncompressed with bz2 and tell you to take a hike. But we'll do that, and we'll uncompress those three files. Wait a moment while it's working. The next command is going to be gunzip. So we had bunzip2 star.bz2, the period in there. And it's going to be gunzip star.gz. So the, the bunzip finished, and we'll say gunzip star.gz. That one was small, so it uncompressed really fast. So now if we scroll back up to that list command, looking for gz's and bz2's, we hit enter again, it said I couldn't find anything, sorry. So those are now uncompressed. And for example, if we take a look at the 04 and hit tab, so ls-l04 and then hit tab, and you'll see that there's no longer a .bz2 at the end of that file. It's gone from being 3.7 megabytes to 10 megabytes. It's now much bigger, and we can run file on that file. So now we're running file on a file, if I've got you confused yet, and hit enter. And now it just says it's binary data that I don't know anything about. Well, that sucks. It would be nice if this knew and told us that, I mean, what I know this is, is this is actually uh, SIMRAD data from the coastal surveyor with Captain Ben at the helm from 2008. But we don't know that from this file yet. It hasn't told us what's going on. There's a couple commands we can do to go look at binary data, if you're brave. That less command that we've seen before to look at files. So if we type less, zero, four, this is that pager command that's running with a man page. If it sees binary data, it's going to try and protect you from it. It's going to show you as much as it can and not blow up. So we're going to type less and our file. And it's going to say, this may be binary. You might not like what you're going to see in a moment. Do you want to continue? And we definitely want to see what's in there. So we're going to hit Y and U. That's gross. Everything in white is a non-printable character. So it's some binary byte that doesn't represent a character. It represents just data. And so there's no character to go with it. And like we have little smiley faces running around. That's not something that's meant to be English text. But there's things in here that are in text. And unfortunately, we now have them mushed together. And that's not very much fun. And there, there might be lots of this stuff. And who knows where it is in the file. And this is the part where you start having with Linux all these little commands that work together. There's a command called strings that goes into data. And it finds all the human readable, or that human readable being quotes, things it thinks might be readable on a file. Now, don't hit Enter when you do this, or you're going to be sitting there waiting for lots of text to go by. We're going to use that pipe command. And those of you from British countries or British English, WC does not mean water closet. It means word count. Q. The same as the man page. So Q. Please do shout out if you get stuck. It takes a lot of repetition until you start seeing the patterns and know when to be hitting Q, when to do Control C, etc. So do ls space star dot bz2. Hit enter. So you want to do less, just type less space and then 04 and then press tab. So then press enter. You'll, it just says, do you want to see this? You say yes with a Y and you get binary junk. Hit Q to quit out of the pager, so you're out of less. Great. It's nice that we can look at this stuff, but we want to run the string command, and it's going to take any series of characters that are numbers, spaces, or letters. If it's got more than four of them in a row, it's going to grab that out and show us this. WC counts 
the number of words and lines in a text set. Mm -hmm. Rather than send it to head, we're going to send the results to WC. And we're going to count the number of words and lines that we're going to get back if we run this command. So we're going to get back 21,000 or 22,000 lines. We're going to get 26,000 words and 143,000 characters. That's a lot of stuff to read. So we're going to go ahead and do the same thing, but we're going to pass it to that command head. So this is going to give us the first 10 lines out of those string sets. Before we had all that binary goo running around in between. So now we have this thing that looks like it was meant for humans. You can kind of, if you know what a P2Z equals zero means, you can actually read this and maybe get something out of it. And if you start skimming through some of these binary files, there's often text in there that you can grab out. In fact, you can actually pull out the GPS locations from this file because they're in there as NEMA strings as actual ASCII text. So if you search, I think it's for GGA or GGL in this file, you'll actually find the GPS strings. But if we look here, we're reading through all this, we can say, I don't know what all this stuff is, blah, 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 lots of junk. But down here, wait a second, this starts looking like I can actually read that. Hydro 2008, day two, CECOM, day one of summer Hydro 2008. So we know nothing about what this file is, but we now have something that we can go ask people about. So if someone handed you this file and said, please process this, you could then go walk around CECOM and try to find someone who knew what Summer Hydro 2008 was, and maybe there's some information on it. So this way, you don't know anything about the file format, but you already know something about it. You've gone in there and figured out a little bit and used the power of these Linux tools to dig into stuff that can be a little scary. Now let's see what happens. I'm going to try something and be brave that isn't in my notes. If I pipe that to less, we can see lots and lots of this stuff. So this GGA right here is one of those GPS strings. I want to show you a command called grep, which stands for general regular expressions. Right now, don't worry about what a regular expression is. Just know that it's going to search for patterns in text. And the simplest pattern is an exact match. So we had a GGA string that we were looking for. So we want to ask it, go find us all the GGA strings. So we basically take the output of strings from our .all file. We're going to pass that to this weird grep program that you have just seen and you've never really done anything with. And we're going to want to, to only return to us these GGA strings that come from a GPS. And if you hit enter, you see a whole pile of GPS strings that have been stuffed into this binary file. Based on this, you can actually go write a little bit of code without reading any of the binary to plot the ship track for this file. This is pretty cool because we've taken a binary data file, we don't even know how to parse binary data yet, and we've grabbed the GPS coordinates. If you really had to, you could do this by hand, load it into an, a text editor, and if we look in here, we actually, it looks like we might have some coordinates. So we've got north and west in here. You have to figure out is this lat long and how to make it lat long, but you're on your way to being able to parse GPS data from this file. More exciting, so if we have this file, star, pipe head, if we go back to this, what is everything in here? Go back to this JPEG that we had. So we had some image. This is a picture of some sort. And what it says here is that it's a JPEG image data, and there's lots of formats of Im images. There's GIFs or GIFs. There's PNGs. There's a good 50 or 60 commonly used image formats. Let's see what else is in there. We can use that grep command. So we'll do file star, the vertical bar for the pipe. Grep is we're going to search for some text, and we're going to search for the word image. It's possible that images might have something else in them, but here we've actually gone and asked it, and it came back with a TIFF. The neat thing about TIFFs is that some of them are geotiffs, meaning that inside them is embedded a whole bunch of geospatial information about where that TIFF is on the world. So some image, some sort. In this case, I know it's a raster, but I'll, we'll look at that in a minute. This is basically representing some patch of the Earth. That's great. Now we have two images, but we know very little about them. I mean, how many pixels are they? 
Are they located any place in the Earth? Are there any notes in them? We really don't know too much about them. So let's go and learn some quick commands to deal with images, because I think images are fun because we get to see stuff pretty quickly. And if I can do it fast enough, before you leave today, we're going to see a pretty cool picture from last week, or at least the last couple days. The first command we're going to do is called identify. And this is a part of a package called image magic. So it's going to be identify. And then I'm going to go ahead and be lazy and type star.jpeg and star.tif. And one thing to realize, JPEG images often also have no E in their extension. People have different ways of writing it. These things are just hints. So that we, they could also be stored as whatever and we would then have a harder time. But having things in a consistent convention makes it easy. You hit enter, yuck. It doesn't look great, but from here down, these are warnings from the TIFF file about tags that ImageMagic didn't know about. We don't care if it's grumpy and having a bad day. We care about when it worked. And what we'll see in here is the JPEG came back and it gave the image size. So it's 12,000 by 1,000 pixels. It's an 8-bit color image. If you don't know how to read that as an 8-bit color image, you'll get used to it. This TIFF here, it's a lot bigger. It's 32,000 pixels by 1,200 pixels. And it's an 8-bit grayscale. So we now know a little bit more. That's, that's great, but we don't actually know too much about it. Better if you could see it. I mean, wouldn't that be nice if you could take a look at a picture <laughs> rather than just see text about it? So there's a really nice command called display. If we say display star.jpeg and star.tiff, it's going to pop up on our screen picture. So if you're used to Photoshop and a tool called the GIMP, you're used to file open and you go find some stuff. This way, you can write a script that's doing something and it produces an image in its process or it grabs it from a camera somewhere out in the world and it will then just display it. So if we hit display, you're now looking out the top of the Healy. This is the ship that a good number of Seacom folks are on right now up in the Arctic. And this picture is from September 12th, so yesterday. And you're now looking out the Aloftcon camera. And up top, in text written into the picture, they've got the date, the time, where they were, the air temperature, the wind speed, et cetera, et cetera. If you hit the space bar, it's going to work for a second, and you're going to see something that's kind of weird looking. This actually is some nice geologic data. This is a LiDAR data set, airborne laser looking down from a plane at the area right around us. This is a NOAA survey of bathymetric LiDAR. You have to be used to LiDAR to sort of recognize what might be in here and why it looks like it does. But you know, you get used to that over time. And here you've at least seen the picture, and you could go, uh, print it out and show it to somebody. If you hit Q, you're back to your terminal. Image magic is the set of tools. You will not find a command called image magic. You'll find identify and is one of them. There's a bunch of options and display. Image magic has lots of commands. Some of them are very strange called mogrify, which I'm not sure what that does. These are just simple commands to be able to, to change images. You can also convert images. It has a nice convert command. So if someone asks you for a JPEG of a TIFF, you can quickly do it from the command line and make lots of various formats. But let's take another look at some more tools. And we're going to come back to Image Magic. We're going to use it a lot. We're going to come back to this next tool, and we're going to use it even more. And this tool is called GDAL, the Geospatial Data Abstraction Library. And they have a tool called GDAL Info. GDAL Info is a great program that works on a lot of different image formats, especially if they're geospatially enabled. It can tell us about files that have location in them. So let's take our Healy image. So the Healy image starts with 2011, and then I hit tab. So there's our JPEG from the Healy. If we hit enter for GDAL Info, it's going to scroll off the screen, which is a bummer. And we'll back up here and take a quick peek at what's in here. So here we ran the command, and then after that comes all the output. It told us that it's using this particular driver. It's very wordy and likes to tell us everything it's thinking. It told us how big the picture is right here. It said the coordinate system is blank, so it didn't know what coordinate system was being used. But the cool thing is, inside the metadata section, and this is where metadata is actually exciting, 
despite the fact that many of you may, may groan if you hear the word metadata. There's these things called EXIF tags in JPEG format. If the picture actually knows where it is spatially, there'll be these EXIF GPS latitude longitude. And so here you can see that the latitude is marked as 81 degrees, 14 minutes, 24 seconds north, and 126, 47, 30 west. So that's way up in the Arctic. So it wasn't too surprising that we saw pictures of ice out that window. They're way up there. If you give a few more years, there might not be any ice. And then it goes through and tells you about the various bands. To have a color image, you have R, G, and B, so you have three bands. We'll get more into that as we go through images. So that worked pretty well, and we got back this point. So that picture was taken at that particular X and Y on the Earth. Well, let's go look at that geotiff, because that geotiff was actually mapped to a, an area of the Earth, not just a point. So we'll do GDAL info. And I'm going to hit tab to get which one I'm looking for. So I'm looking for the one on the left. So that's H11296. Five meter hillshade. If you work around NOAA a lot, you'll start to recognize their survey number pattern. This is a hydrographic survey with some number after it, which doesn't really tell you too much other than it's the sequence of surveys. So we'll do the GDAL info on our hillshade TIFF. And we get back a little bit more information. TIFF is a little bit more focused on giving you geospatial information. When you get to the coordinate system is, you get this huge block of stuff. And this tells you it's a WGS84 datum with a particular shape of the Earth. It tells you what the units are, that they're in degrees. It tells you this thing called EPSG codes. You'll see those throughout the semester. These codes, if you know the EPSG code for something, you know the projection that it's in. And there's a whole database of these. And if we come down here to the corner coordinates, this tells you the bounding box that, that this image is in. So if you were to have a map, this tells you those four corner locations. And if you drew the Earth, put a map in there, and then pasted that image on top of that location, that's where it goes. So this file knows exactly where it is on the Earth. I'm sorry, I'm trouble getting the H11. Type GDL info H11, and hit tab, hit tab a bunch of times. So the first time you hit tab, it doesn't want to show you anything more unless it can exactly match. If you hit tab a couple times, then it starts showing you the options, and you can add a little bit more. So you want to hit two, and then hit tab. It gives you a little bit more, hit tab a couple times to get the next list. And here you're looking for an underscore to make the next character. Keep going. There you go. So now you see it's saying, I've got three options. You're, you're at H11, and now you need to pick a two is the next character you want. So press two, hit tab again a couple times. So it gives you a list. Keep, uh, keep tabbing. See how you hit it twice fast? Then it shows you a list. You've now got two options, and you can either do an underscore or a dash, and the one you want is this TIFF on the left with the underscore. So shift and that key. So shift that. Now press tab. Now press enter. And now you have the whole info. And you can use the scroll wheel on the mouse to scroll back up and get the info. And if ever you're feeling like you know, you're ahead of things and you're, you're, you're all caught up, I know that, it, that sometimes can be tough. If, you, if you're waiting on something and you're ahead, you can read the man pages on any of these things or Google them in a web browser and just read ahead a little bit. It's, it's well worth the time to invest in these things. And the next step that I was going to do today was to create a script. And we've only got five minutes, so I'm going to walk through it. Don't worry about following along. I'm going to bring up Emacs. I'm going to create a little script and run it. And then next time on Thursday, we'll start creating a script. As you learn these commands, you can build up a little file that if you have a new set of data, you can rerun all these commands on it as you go. So the key thing to remember is we're in a shell where it's keeping track of stuff. And if I want to see what I've been doing, I can type history. And it's going to give you a numbered list where the number is the item. And if you remember Ben's comment before, you can say a bang in one of those numbers and you'll rerun it. So we could say, I want to rerun the display command. So that was number right here, 32. I can do bang 32. And I now see the picture. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to try and grab a couple commands together and put them into a file where we can rerun them. Because these are just in your history, 
And if you send that, you can't send that history very easily to someone else and have it work. So I'm going to go ahead and run a new Emacs. The old style of Emacs is all keyboard shortcuts, and you don't get any help at all, really, unless you know the keyboard shortcut to get help, which can be very frustrating. The new version of Emacs for the last few years, so you guys all have a big leg up on me. It took me a long time to get some of this stuff, is you get menu options. And they'll tell you the keyboard shortcut on the right as you go. Control X, Control F would open a file. But we'll just use the menus for now, and we'll get into keyboard shortcuts as we go later. So I'm going to visit a new file. It doesn't show you any of the directories, so I want to go and select this little arrow next to Browse for other folders. Click the down arrow. Now it's showing me the, the folders just like you would with most file tools. So I'm going to find our examples directory, which is right here. I'll double click on that. Now I'm inside of examples. I'm going to name it my-script-sh. Later on, we'll explain why I might name something like that. I'm going to hit OK. And now I'm staring at a blank page, which isn't very helpful. You have to know where you're going at this point, which is my job to give you guys a coach through it. And we have a simple command. If we do echo hello world, it's just going to print something out. So we'll use that just to get started. We'll say echo hello from my script. And I'm going to go up, file, save. So now it's saved. If I go back to the terminal, ls-l. Now if I do a dash t, it's going to sort by time. And dash r is a reverse sort. You'll start to get used to these. I'm going to keep telling you what I'm doing as I do it. And hopefully you'll pick them up slowly. And what this will do is put everything in sorted order for time. And the most recent thing will be at the bottom. So there's a lot of files that go scrolling by. But at the bottom is myscript.sh. Now it's not showing up as executable. We don't have to worry about that right now. There is a command to run shell scripts that we'll do in a second. But I can type less and my-script. And we can take a look at that file, make sure it matches what we think. Yep. And then I can say source my-script. And this is going to run all the commands in that file as if you typed them at the console. And it writes a very exciting hello from my script. And with that, I think we're going to leave it here for today. And we'll get back into this on Thursday. We'll actually have you guys writing a script. I think we might try to download some images from the Healy and make a little movie. So if you guys want to see an animation of the Healy driving around the ice, we'll give that a go on Thursday. And we'll get some action on the screen, make it some, some visual content here.